Good morning. Good morning. Calamari. That's Greek if you're Edward. <laughs> My Greek teacher is here today, so I'm not going to speak any Greek at all. It's not going to happen. <laughs> all right. Okay, so I have a question for the married couples out there. When you leave the house, do you ever take your wedding ring off? If you do, <laughs> why? There could be work-related reasons, right? Maybe you operate machinery or something like that, and the ring is going to cause your hand to get stuck. A normal ringtone, that's pretty good. <laughs> so maybe you have some good reasons for that. I don't know. But if you do this, is your spouse okay with it? Do they know? Now, some people are definitely not okay with this. And so, they come up with this remedy. They get the wedding ring tattooed on the finger. It seems to work. I actually know people who have done this. I'm not going to name names. But for example, the Johnsons, they did that, so, <laughs> you know, it's, I guess it works, but anyway. <laughs> now, here's another question. If you take the wedding ring off, are you still married? Does it still count? Many moons ago, I got married. Almost 20 years ago now, hard to believe. And when we got married, we were kind of nervous. Right? A lot of emotions. It's normal. Big day. Not cold feet, though. We had a nice long engagement and courtship. Just normal nerves. Now, Heather might have been a little more nervous than me because when it came time to exchange the rings, her turn came and she put the ring on the wrong hand. So I let her do it. I didn't want to ruin the moment. It might have been my fault. I could be wrong, right? Learn a lesson, guys. It could have been my fault. <laughs> if I was like black belt level married, I would have said it was totally my fault. I mean, I had the right hand a little too far forward and it just, you know, hands, they both kind of look the same, you know, so what are you going to do? Anyway, <laughs> my fault. She put it on the right. So, I just didn't say anything as it was happening. I didn't want to ruin the moment. But after the ring was on, I looked at the officiant and I said, does it still count? <laughs> do we need to do this over again? All right, today we find ourselves in Genesis, chapters 11 through 20-ish. It's a lot. I'm not going to read it all to you. I'm going to paraphrase a bunch of it. We're going to talk about Abraham, or Abram. He's kind of a big deal in the Old and New Testament. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, in John 8, 
to proclaim his deity. They want to kill him for that because Abraham's a really big deal. If you like the parables and you jump over to Luke, you get to chapter 16 and you have the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus is a poor guy. He's got sores all over him. He's not doing so good. And the rich man doesn't care, passes by him, doesn't even give him anything to eat. There are sores all over him and dogs are licking at him. It's kind of gross. Well, he dies and he goes to heaven. The rich man dies and, well, he goes to hell. But if you read the Greek, it is called heaven, the bosom of Abraham. That is where he is. That's how important Abraham is. And the rich man has a dialogue with him. Basically, you're not getting out of here. I can't give you anything to drink. Sorry, you had your chance. Anyway, the point is, Abraham, big, big deal. We're in chapter 11, and we get to more genealogies, more people. We go from Noah, his son Shem, and now Shem's line, his descendants, We go through about seven-ish super generations, starting at people who live 500-something years old, and then it starts narrowing down here to about 230 years old, and then we get to Terah. This is Abram's dad, and it talks about his family. You might know some of them. Lot, Sarah, or Sarai at this point, I will explain later. Then you get to 12, and it says this, Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran. He headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up a camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. So just a note. Did you notice that it is God who decides who gets to be famous? Another little reversal of Babel. It is said that Abraham had great faith. The book of Hebrews defines faith for us. 11.1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That is my mistake there. It is Hebrews 11, 1. I just typed it wrong. I was wrong. (laughs) Does it make Robert feel good today too? Everybody. I can do that for you. (laughs) You learned that in pastor school. Now, I've... (laughs) I've told you before that the New Testament is the best commentary we have on the Old Testament. So let's hang there for a little bit in Hebrews. Because of Abraham, Hebrews says this, 11.8. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land, that God would give him as his inheritance He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner, living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Today we're going to skip around a little bit. We're going to look at larger sections of Scripture. So I get it, the verse of the day can be nice. Sometimes when you read a chapter, you get a little better idea of what's going on, the context, but when you read whole books or large sections, you really get to know the context, and you begin connecting dots on certain topics. The Bible does that. It'll kind of go in and out, especially when it tells stories, like movie scenes. It'll cut away to something else going on either before, after, or at the same time. So this morning, what we're going to do is skip around 
and connect the dots. Look at this story topically. Two weeks, this week and next week on Abram, then Abraham. And we'll see what's going on here. So eventually, here's what happens. They're traveling, and Lot and Abram separate. Why? They're herdsmen. You have lots of sheep, probatos. <laughs> anyway, and they have lots of workers, and they start quarreling. There's problems there. So Abraham does this. He says, look, pick any land out there. And he does. And so we see something very important. The Sodom story actually begins when Lot walks by sight and not by faith. It begins right here at this choice. So they outgrow one another. Abraham says, pick. Lot picks the beautiful but wicked land. This gets him to Sodom. And again, before we get to that Sodom and Gomorrah account, there's another important thing that happens. Lot gets enslaved. So we can see that choosing the thing that just looks beautiful can sometimes get you enslaved. This is where the married men need to be quiet. Something happens. Lot gets to Sodom. Then, cutaway scene, Ketaliomer. He's this king. People don't like him for whatever reason. 12, 13 years goes by, and there's a series of battles against him. Then you get to the Valley of the Dead Sea, Siddim, and there's like this final battle there. You have Ketaliomer and three kings, and then you have, on the other side, Sodom, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, and three other kings. Four against five, but there's tar pits in this area. And the people from Sodom get stuck. So Ketaliomer defeats them, takes a bunch of plunder, and the people, including Lot. Abram finds out about it, or Abraham, finds out about it, and he takes 318 trained men. He attacks Ketaliomer and gets the stuff back, the plunder, all the stuff, and Lot. As he's going back home, he runs into a guy we've talked about in the past, Melchizedek, a very mysterious character. Hebrews tells us about him. Hebrews 7, starting at verse 1. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice, and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God, resembling the Son of God. He's a Christophany, he's a type of Christ that appears. What was the point in the book of Hebrews? The whole point of the whole thing. Jesus is superior to all of these Old Testament things. So the author or preacher picks a great high priest. It goes on to say, even better than Aaron and that priesthood from Levi, the priests in the law of Moses. Melchizedek is even better than him. He uses something very interesting to make that point. He says that the seed of Levi was in Abraham when he tithes to him. So, priests from the law of Moses tithes to Melchizedek, making him better. But the point is that Jesus is superior even to that great high priest. Good point, good connection to Jesus. Let's keep going. After this, Lot, he goes back to Sodom. So we're gonna take a little jump into 1819 of Genesis. But just before it, you have this interaction with these three men. Very interesting. We'll get to that interaction between Sarah and Abraham and these three men in, well, next week. We'll do it next week. But it's important because after the interaction, two men go to Sodom. The Lord is going to destroy it. Third one, the Lord stays. So those are the two angels that go. 
the Lord stays. And he says, well, should I tell Abraham about this, what I'm about to do? He says, okay, I will. So he tells him. Abraham intercedes. We see people do this with God in the Old Testament. Moses, for example, intercedes for the Israelites. But Abraham, he's kind of like a good lawyer. He starts lawyering God. He says, wait a minute. You shouldn't punish the righteous people with the wicked people. So what if there are 50 righteous people there? Would you still destroy? And God's like, nah, you know what? I'll spare it for the 50 people. I don't mean to interrupt you in your destroying here, God, but what about 45? How about that? Okay. I'll spare 45. Excuse me. Don't be mad at me, God, but... What about 40? Okay, 40. And he keeps going. 30, 20, 10. Okay, we get him down to 10. He's a really good negotiator. Remember that. Then you get to the typical story, Sodom and Gomorrah. And most of you kind of know it. Even if you've never read the Bible, you get it, right? You have the angels, they're there to get Lot and his family out of there. And then the place gets destroyed. And his wife, not a very good listener. <laughs> Maybe she has an itch. I don't know. She looks back and turns to a pillar of salt. That's what you know. But there's some pretty gross stuff going on in this story. We're going to get disgusting today. So here we go. There's kind of like a courtyard scene in Sodom. And if you're paying really good attention when you read your Bible, it kind of resembles another story in Judges 19, the Levite and the concubine. Another gross story. We'll get to that later. But in that story, it causes quite the rift. It's a very similar scene. Similar things happen. The tribe of Benjamin gets in a little bit of trouble. We'll get there later. But just connecting dots for those of you who know, or you can jot it down. Judges 19. I hope I said Judges. But anyway. Going back, courtyard scene. The angels come into town, Lot sees them, and they're going to stay in the town square. Lot says, nope, don't do that. Don't stay in the town square. Lot probably knows the people there are really evil, bad dudes. So if you stay out here, there's going to be trouble. I insist, wash your feet, eat, stay at my house tonight. No, no, we'll stay at the square. Finally, he convinces them to do it. They go in the house. Well, sure enough, the men there are evil. This is why. Sodom gets destroyed. They're wicked. They are engaged in sexual sin. So they're demanding that Lot sends the angels. They think they're men, I guess. We want to have our way with them. Lot's like, no, take my virgin daughters. Again, similar to Judges 19, what happens here. They say, no, we don't want them. We want the men. Angels are like, all right, we had enough. Blind them. They get confused and kind of scatter. Then he grabs Lot's family, or the angels grab Lot's family, his daughters, his wife, Lot, and lead him out of town. Gets destroyed, pillar of salt. But the angels say, go to the mountains. Go there. Lot's like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. What about that little town, Zoar? It's a little place. They say, okay, fine. So they go, Lot and his two daughters, and live there for a time. But it says, Lot's scared of the people. He leaves and he goes and lives in a cave. Well, the daughters must have forgotten that there are still people in the world, like in the little town. They think there's no one else in the world to populate with. So the best solution to this problem is, of course, to sleep with your father. So that's what they do. <laughs> First the oldest, then the youngest. Now, you may have known that, but... You might not have known that what happens here actually connects to Jesus. A lot of people don't know. The oldest one is Moab, from father, it sounds like in Hebrew. Interesting. Well, if you know about Ruth, you know she's a Moabite. She's from this genealogy. And Ruth makes her way into Jesus' genealogy. Story of redemption, we'll get there. They didn't have faith, I guess. Now, as I said, Abraham, being an important figure, he's written about in the Old and the New Testament, as we saw from Hebrews, 
Paul talks about them in Galatians and Romans. We're going to save Galatians for next week. But here's what it says about him in Romans. Actually, it says a lot about him in chapter 4. No one got that. It was just that bad. Romans 4, 3. <laughs> For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, we're going to look at covenants today. This is going to be really important. And we'll see that even before Abraham did anything, like get circumcised, he had faith. But Abraham's a little worried because he doesn't have a son. And so he thinks Eliezer is going to get all his stuff. He's going to be his heir. So then the Lord says, Genesis 15, 4, the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So we're going to do a little more hopping around. Here we have Genesis 15 and 17, where we see covenants. They're kind of two parts of this covenant, the initiation and the promise, and then what Abraham has to do. Or Abram, Abram, we'll find out in a minute. At the beginning here, I want you to think of covenants as a marriage. You can think of it like a business deal, an arrangement between two parties, but as this is initiated, let's just put that in our minds this morning. Covenants as a marriage. First, Genesis 17. So we're going to look at the covenant itself. We'll hop over there. Genesis 17, 4. This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. The name change. Abram, exalted father to Abraham, father of many. Sarai gets a name change too. But hers is kind of similar. Sarah, both kind of mean princess. So that's that. Maybe she was like jealous, like, hey, I want a name change too. You know, so they're like, fine, Sarah means the same thing, but whatever, shut up. <laughs> it doesn't say any of that in there, just so you know. <laughs> so covenants. <laughs> As we, in the message version, it says that. So uh, <laughs> I can stop. All right. Covenants have a sign. Noah. Everybody knows this. What's the sign of the covenant? Noah. A rainbow. Very good. Now, let's look at the slightly more painful sign of this covenant with Abraham. Genesis 17, starting at verse 7. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan where you live as a foreigner now. To you and your descendants, it will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Circumcision is a sign of this covenant. It is the removal of the foreskin, the surrender of the first portion of the bodily instrument used to fulfill this covenant and the command to be fruitful and multiply. It is a sign of a willingness to submit yourself, or a very important part of yourself, to God. That's what it's all about. Now, Jesus fulfilled this when his parents had him circumcised. We see that in Luke chapter 2. But 
there is something you probably don't know. That is the rest of this story. It is said that throughout church history, there is such a thing as a holy foreskin. Jesus's. And it was a relic that had miraculous power. And speaking of wedding rings, St. Catherine of Siena, this is in the mid-1300s, to symbolize her marriage with Christ was said to wear the holy foreskin as a ring on her finger. You guys can say, ew, now. It's okay. <laughs> if we go back to about 13-ish years, before the circumcision, I'll change the topic now. You guys got really uncomfortable there. There's an initial blood covenant. In the ancient world, you would have a blood covenant. And what would happen is you'd split animals apart. And then the parties would walk through the blood as if to say, if I break this covenant, this should happen to me. That's what's going on here. So this is what happens between Abraham or Abram and God at this point. So a cow, a ram, and a female sheep. I think they're all three years old, and there are a couple birds, a turtle dove and a pigeon, but they don't get ripped in half, just the animals. I don't know why. Anyway, it happens, and then this is what happens. Genesis 15, 17. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. This is God passing through. But there's a deeper purpose and foreshadowing of what we're going to see in Exodus. If you know your Bibles, you know about the Passover account. What's going on here? They're in Egypt, enslaved. God is now redeeming them from Egypt. It's going to lead them out. Then this happens. Exodus 13, 21. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud. And he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. Sound familiar? This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. The Lord initiates the covenant and leads the people with this pillar of fire and the cloud or smoke. There's also another foreshadowing of Egypt. If we go back to chapter 12 of Genesis, there's a famine in Canaan. This is the reason that Abraham goes to Egypt, get food. Same reason later in the Joseph account, we'll see that his family comes from Canaan to Egypt. Also, God had told Abram in the first part of the covenant that although he would greatly multiply, they'd be enslaved. 400 or 430 years, and this is what happens in the Exodus account. And also, there's a foreshadowing of the plagues when this happens. Why? It happens in Exodus, and it happens in Genesis too. Because Abraham, or Abram, didn't always have faith. Genesis 12, it tells us that Sarai at this time is very, very beautiful, even though she's 65 years old. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm going to get in trouble for that one. But, so, but, because you'd be thinking of them as young people, they're not. But, Abram is still worried that they're going to take his wife and kill him. So he tells Sarai to tell everyone, I'm his sister. Right? So they had the shirts. They had to change them. Not, I'm with so-and-so or I'm with so -and -so. That's my brother. That's my sister. And so she does. This causes Pharaoh in Egypt to take her into his household. Not a lot of details about what happens after that. I don't know. But the Lord inflicts plagues on them. Sound familiar, right? Then they give Sarai back 
to Abram. And they escort him out of there. But here's the thing. It won't be the last time he does this. And if we hop over to chapter 20, we have a guy named Abimelech. And Abraham now does the same thing. She's my sister. Abimelech and his family get hit with a plague of infertility. Gets kind of upset. And he asks Abram, after God comes to him in a vision, a dream, tells him what happened. He's like, why did you do this? So here's what it says. Genesis 20, 11, Abraham replied, I thought this is a godless place. They want my wife and will kill me to get her. And she really is my sister. For we both have the same father but different mothers. And I married her. When God called me to leave my father's home and to travel from place to place, I told her, do me a favor. Wherever we go, tell the people that I'm your brother. Because he is. It's true. So that seems pretty gross. <laughs> I told you, today's going to be gross. But even if you knew that, most people don't realize that if we go back to Genesis 11, there's more grossness going on. Abram's brother Nahor married his niece. That's Haran, his dead brother's daughter. So, Abraham, or Abram, took the wedding ring off a couple of times. When we take it off, does it still count? You guys said yes. That's true. It does count if we are faithful. It does if we're married in our heart. If we're living faithfully and not by sight, going after that which is beautiful, like Lot did, and getting enslaved, but living faithfully. We must wear the ring on our hearts. If we go to Deuteronomy in chapter 30, we're coming near the end of Israel's wanderings. So they wander around for 40 years because they're disobedient after this redemption. Well, there are blessings and curses pronounced. The idea here is if the Israelites are faithful to God, they'll get the blessings. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, right? So they're pronouncing these things or they're going to. But if you are not faithful, you'll get the curses. So before you quote the end of Deuteronomy to me about blessings, read the rest. It's pretty bad. In fact, through the prophet Moses... God tells them, it's going to be bad. You're going to be disobedient, and all these very horrible things will happen to you. But in the midst of it, there's hope. Deuteronomy 30, 6, a future time. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul, and so you may live. It's not the only time the Bible says that, Jeremiah 9. God is going to punish those with uncircumcised hearts, tells it in reverse. Paul writes this. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God and not from people. If we are faithful to the covenants that we've made in our hearts and not simply putting on a show with mere symbols or outward signs that can be taken off, that which is planted in a fertile heart becomes deeply rooted. Remember the parable of the sower. A fertile heart. These things cannot easily be uprooted or taken off. Our faith will bring us into right relationship with God. Our firm belief in our mind and our heart that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that he will come again and we too will rise with him in this way 
We live by faith and not by sight. Romans 4.20. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. And he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. And therefore... Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Amen.